elected the Dominican Republic as it elected Jorge Blanco and Mr. Blanco. And we're delighted to have them here for this photo opportunity. So, with this <laughs> Do you have anything to say on any other matter? No. <laughs> okay. All right. John P. Klein, Jr., United States Marine Corps, for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service while serving as Marine Corps aide to the President. Major Klein continually distinguished himself in an exemplary manner with sound judgment, diligence, untiring dedication, and exceptionally professional performance. The successful accomplishments of his assignment contributed immeasurably to the Office of the President of the United States. Major Klein's singularly distinctive achievements, personal endeavor, an unswerving devotion to duty reflected great credit upon himself and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. <laughs> service to the United States as Army aide to the President. The responsibilities which Lieutenant Colonel Marotti has borne in this position are unique to the President and the nation. His leadership, exemplary foresight, and ceaseless effort have contributed immeasurably to the office of the President and to the effectiveness of the White House military office. The singularly distinguished achievements of Lieutenant Colonel Marotti reflect great credit upon himself and the United States.
I know you're enjoying the fresh air. <laughs> this is the air that it, in Washington, if it, gets, if it gets any more humid here, you have to swim to work. <laughs> but uh, I'm delighted to see you. Uh, I heard about this project, as you know, and made a statement about it uh, some time ago. But I know that you now are uh, learning on several different campuses about American industry and business and what the world of jobs is like, and I think that is is great. I I had an experience uh, many years later uh, than you're having it when I once was doing a television show for about eight years that was called that was before I uh, quit making an honest living. Uh, <laughs> no, 
I was doing a television show <laughs> and, and for General Electric. And the employer wanted, as a part of an employee relations program, that being seen every Sunday night in the air, I should visit their various plants for about 12 weeks out of each year, which uh, comes down to pretty much about the same time you're spending here. And I must say, it was an experience I've never forgotten and a most valuable one. I, I visited in those eight years 139 plants in 38 states and met a quarter of a million employees individually. But to see there what we take for granted every time we turn on a light bulb or look at TV or anything else, but to see these things made and what goes in to providing everything that we have and everything that we use during the day gave me a very healthy respect that I'd never had before for the whole thing that we call business and industry in America. It really is a miracle. I know when I got to the place where they were making the light bulbs, and I know that Thomas Edison thought of that, and I know it was a very great invention for all of us, but when I saw the machine that was making the light bulbs, I said, never mind Thomas Edison, who invented that machine? And uh, you're having that experience now, not too long ago, you, no one had such an experience as you're having. But I'm not gonna keep on talking. I know that I'm due someplace in a minute and a half and you're going to have others that are, are going to meet with you. But rather than me keep on going, I know that maybe some of you, and I, I'll have to shut this off after a few, but maybe some of you might have a question that you'd like to ask and uh, let me be a part of the whole summer experience. Yes. No, I think what I was talking about then was the fact that that instead of uh, just meeting or having summit meetings and so forth, that all of the things that were wrong, that we feel are wrong in those countries, all the violations of human rights should be on that table as a part of what we discuss. Now we have employed sanctions against the Soviet Union because of what we think they have done in creating this oppression in Poland. Right now I'm being castigated by some of the people in Europe because uh, I have imposed the sanctions on American-made equipment that they need for the Russian gas pipeline to Europe. Uh, in the first place, I don't think the pipeline is a good idea. I don't think that the Western world should make itself dependent on the Soviet Union uh, for the energy they need to run their industries and warm their homes so that one day the Soviet Union, if it wants to turn off the valve, can pressure them into doing things they might not want to do. But I meant that those things uh, should be on the table. Now, uh, the matter, for example, of, of uh, sales, commerce with those countries. At the same time, let them know how much better they could get along and that the world could be for them if they weren't doing some things like the young man who's starving himself to death because Russia will not allow him to uh, come to this country to join his wife and his two-year-old daughter whom he's never seen. And uh, then to make things even more cruel, a few days ago uh, they said they were going to let him come. He could come to America and join his wife. And about two days later they changed their minds and said, no, he can't come. And uh, I just believe that those have to be things that we don't just remain quiet about. But at the same time, let me also say this to you. In a world of politics, and that is their political figures too, these leaders that you meet with just as we are, I find that if you try to do business on the front page of the papers and demand and say, hey, you do this, or by golly, we won't do this for you, you've put him in an impossible position because if he then gives in, his own people see him as having been forced into something by the leader of another country. 
So my own belief is in what I've called quiet diplomacy. You don't do it in the front page of the paper, where he then is pushed into a corner where he can't back down. You quietly say to him, hey, do you know how much better things could be? Just between us, if you did this, and how much easier it'd be for me to do something right in the, that you're talking about. And uh, that quiet diplomacy has worked in a couple of instances. Uh, I know one person who was in jail in a foreign country, had done nothing wrong. A lady that was thrown in jail, an American lady. And uh, I persuaded someone of another country to say to the authorities in that country that something they wanted very much from us, they had a lot better chance of getting if that lady was allowed to come home. And 48 hours later, she was on her way home. So if sometimes you don't read about it in the paper, don't think that we're being quiet about it. We're doing things. There's a young girl back there, and then you. Don't you think that by um, cutting back on the amount of money that you're giving to colleges and universities, thereby reducing the amount of scholarships and grants, that you're helping to deny um, underprivileged students a chance for further education? Oh, bless you. The question, if all the rest of you couldn't hear it, was one about that we're cutting back on college grants and loans and so forth, and what this does to underprivileged students who might not have another a chance otherwise to go. This has been very unfairly portrayed. Uh, we're not doing that. We found that a great many of the loans and the grants were going to people whose family incomes were of a level that we felt that family could do more than they were doing to help their son or daughter go to school. For example, when some of these grants and loans were being given to uh, young people whose family income was $30,000, $35,000 a year, we have redirected those programs. Granted, we've taken them away from people at that level and redirected them to families whose incomes were only $12,000 a year, because obviously, today's world of $12,000 a year, you're not going to have enough money to send someone to college. So we have redirected the programs to aim more of them at the truly needy students with regard to getting college help. And in some instances also, we have trimmed what we thought was excessive administrative cost. And this is true of a great many of the social, so-called social reforms. So I can assure you that we have redirected the help to people who need it the most, it isn't a case of cutting it back. When I say administrative overhead, government has a way of instituting a program, and then a bureaucracy grows up to administer that program. And when I was governor of California, I'll just give an example to make it short, I vetoed a program, a federal program that was going to come into California in one county, and they were going to take 17 unemployed welfare recipients and give them jobs cleaning up and working in the parks. Now you'd think I'd be for all for that. I vetoed it because I found out that half the budget was going for 11 administrators' salaries to make sure that the 17 got to work on time. And I figured that that budget was a little unbalanced, that they could hire more than 17 if they didn't have so many bureaucrats. So we're trying to e reduce at that level, the administrative level of the bureaucracy. Now, I said you next, yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your time, Mr. President. And I'd like to ask you, um, this is my, one of my, this is my second time coming to Washington, and I had come years before, and I've noticed on my second visit that Washington as a city itself is somewhat declining, and um, I'm a person that's very interested in urban action and social, sociology and I was just wondering if it's true that you can get in a get into a car and drive maybe two minutes in either direction and, and be faced with quite vivid adversity at a quite a pungent uh, 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 just at just very um, strong and I was just wondering how does that motivate you how does that actuate you and how does that lie on your heart how, how does what do you think of that well, since there has been no real...